Warm greetings to you and welcome to another edition of The Monarchy with me, Samson Seas. This is the programme that provides the alternative viewpoint regarding the United Kingdom. We give you the stories that go unaired on corporate television networks. Take the Treason Act of 1351, for example. Such a medieval law still exists and it seems that people not being loyal to the monarch are being targeted by that rule. We'll come back to that one very soon. Meanwhile, Westminster may have to prepare itself for some fresh meat next year. And that meat happens to be the UK Independence Party, or UK. Whatever you want to call it, the anti-European Union group is on the move and is heading in the Prime Minister's direction. You better watch out, Tories. Here's more. Treason has a remarkable history. Even in Victorian times, it warranted medieval punishments. Even in modern Britain, it warranted capital punishment. It is simply one of the most emotive and hysterical bits of statute in the UK. There is certainly more public debate about it than there are charges. So it is of little surprise that the British MPs are warming to the idea of using it against those Brits going to fight in Syria. A British MP describes ISIL as a bizarre mix of warped theology, inner city gang culture and a slick PR machine. The root causes of the ISIL cult are not hard to imagine, and there are times that those involved in the creation and financing of the cult unwittingly engage in a blame game. A recent instance of this blame game happened on the 2nd of October when US Vice President Joe Biden made one of his off-the-cuff remarks at Harvard University's Institute of Politics. Our biggest problem is our allies. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks were great friends, and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. The Saudis, the Emiratis, etc. What were they doing? They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni-Shia war, what did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. Except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Now you think I'm exaggerating, take a look. Thanks to the so-called Friends of Syria, forced conversions have returned to Iraq and Syria after a 900-year gap. Now ISIL is converting anyone other than Tekfiris at gunpoint. ISIL militants are breaking into our homes, taking our things, going into our churches, taking down the cross, and breaking the statues of Mother Mary and Jesus Christ. I'm a citizen from Karakosh. I escaped with seven of my family members. We were scared to death. I said militants were shooting at us as we ran away. I really wasn't sure I was going to make it to Erbil alive. It has instituted a policy of forced marriage and the sale of captured women as brides. The open sale of women has not been seen for centuries. Syria 
گلگ تانی نبا ما بیکر زو جی مش دور خاطر کی تانی گور گم بیکر زو جی بس تب سلمان بی کو بیکر زو جی بس تیز بس سلمان نبوین از باور از باور جی meanwhile with the isil terrorists mounting more gory adventurism in syria and iraq and capturing villages and towns there seems to be no tangible impediment to stop this influx of terror by the West. Listening to American and British leaders, one would think that Barack Obama and David Cameron are knights in shining armor on an epic crusade to defeat global evil. But a review of their actions leads to the fact that American and British allies are clearly not interested in taking effective action against ISIL, and their actions are limited to rather stupid show-offs. British judicial system is about to witness evolution in reverse, resurrecting a medieval law dating back to 1351. Any British citizen who has sworn personal allegiance to ISIL could have committed an offence under the Treason Act of 1351, which was passed during the reign of King Edward III. It all started after the Tory MP, Philip Hollobone, claimed in a parliamentary session that the British ISIL militants who returned from Iraq and Syria should be prosecuted for the offence of treason because their actions are treachery against Her Majesty. And aiding and abetting enemies of Her Majesty is one of the greatest offences a British citizen can commit. Philip Hollobone is a standard-issue swivel-eyed right-wing Tory backbencher. He is the same person whose last contribution of any note was an illiberal private member's bill aimed at banning the wearing of the niqab in public and who threatened to spurn any constituent who sought help so attired. One might happily have dismissed Hollobone's statement as tabloid hyperbole, but surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, Hollobone is not alone in this. The Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, told the House that ministers have indeed discussed reaching up to that very distant shelf and dusting off the Treason Act. The Treason Act 1351 is an act of the Parliament of England which codified and curtailed the common law offence of treason. It was extended to Ireland in 1495 and to Scotland in 1708. The act was passed at Westminster in the Hillary term of 1351, in the 25th year of the reign of Edward III and was entitled, A Declaration Which Offences Shall Be Adjudged Treason. The Act distinguishes two varieties of treason, high treason and petty treason, the first being disloyalty to the sovereign and the second being disloyalty to a subject. The practical distinction was the consequence of being convicted. For a high treason, the penalty was death by hanging, drawing and quartering for a man or drawing and burning for a woman and the traitor's property would escape to the crown. In the case of a petty treason, the penalty was drawing and hanging without quartering, or burning without drawing, and property escheated only to the traitor's immediate lord. The last person to be charged with treason in Britain was William Joyce in 1946. Nicknamed Lord Haw Haw, he was executed for broadcasting for Nazi Germany. Traitors faced execution until the law was changed in 1998. Since then, the maximum penalty for treason in Britain is life in jail. Social and political observers have surprisingly dismissed the practicality of the Treason Act in confronting ISIL. Lawyers argue that treason is a citizen's actions to help a foreign government overthrow, make war against, or seriously injure the parent's nation. Using this definition, treason wouldn't even apply. For ISIL, is neither a foreign government nor a state. Meanwhile, it is argued that the real danger of resurrection of the over 600-year-old act is its wordings and how it defines treason as not being loyal to the monarch. A big chunk of the public don't want a monarch, and the approval of the remainder is contingent on the royals keeping out of politics. Thus, the musty idea that jihadis should desist and show allegiance to the crown that many non-jihadis would not share is doomed to fail. What if this law were to be abused by the police state? 
Welcome to the United Kingdom of Perpetual Panic, where the crackpot ideas of silly backbenchers fuel the ordinary citizen's nightmares and sustain its enemies. For well over a century, Britain has split along left-right lines, often on the basis of class. Today, the dividing lines are becoming ever more complex, with the political marketplace fragmenting and voting patterns increasingly driven by cultural attitudes. UKIP 21,113. The UK Independence Party's gains in the recent local elections have generated a good deal of media attention, as well as exercising some of the liveliest minds in the main political parties. Well, there were two by-elections, one where we lost a seat to UKIP and one where Labour held on to their seat. And this speaks to a wider truth, which is that if you vote UKIP, you're in danger of getting a Labour government with Ed Miliband as Prime Minister, Ed Balls as Chancellor, and you'll get no action on immigration, no European referendum, and obviously, most importantly, you won't get a continuation of the plan uh, that's delivering success for our economy and security uh, for our people. But it's almost unheard of for a Prime Minister to go to a, a by-election anyway. Usually they don't want to risk their reputation if they lose. Uh, to have a Prime Minister coming four times in succession is, is really fairly extraordinary and shows a high level of concern. It's perhaps not surprising to see the Tories' panicked reaction to the opening up of an old wound around Europe. But Labour, and indeed the Lib Dems, both have reasons to worry about the potential threat that Farage's party might pose. What we saw was a Tory party losing in their own backyard in Clacton and in retreat on what used to be their front line in the northwest but there won't be a shred of complacency from us as we reach out to all of those voters who didn't vote Labour and those who didn't vote at all. You Thank say it's you. a bad night for the Tories. I totally accept, of course, the, the, the verdict of, of voters uh, last week that um, we did not win the, the case that I was putting and that my party was putting. I think it was right that we stuck to our values. I think it was right that we made the case for an open, generous-hearted, internationalist Britain. Not a Britain that turns in on itself, not a Britain that sort of blames everything else on, on foreigners, but of course I accept that's not, a, uh, not an argument that prevailed in the, in the ballot box. But I think it is an argument which we will need to continue to make, and not, by the way, just the Liberal Democrats. I think anyone who believes in an, in an open, generous-hearted future for this country needs to make that case. The argument has now started, uh, and, and, I, and I hope and believe over time it will be won. Much of the discussion around UKIP's rise has emphasised the anger that substantial numbers of voters now feel towards the political class as a whole. I've been a member of UKIP for six weeks and all the time I've been in politics I've been looking for something like this, a party that is for ordinary people, it's not run by and for the convenience of career politicians and it's wonderful. The MP's expenses scandal has been the most obvious feature in an increasingly poisonous climate of distrust and cynicism, which views politicians of all colours as an out of touch elite that is far removed from and largely unconcerned with the everyday struggles of ordinary people. What UKIP offers here, so the story goes, is a stick with which to bash the major parties. People are sick to death of career politicians in Westminster. They want real change. And that's what the vote for UKIP's all about. You know, I've no doubt this morning we'll hear, oh, well, it's just a protest vote. It's nothing of the kind. People from across the spectrum are saying they've had enough of career politics, they want to have a proper voice in Westminster, and from today with Douglas Carswell they've got one, and in a few weeks' time I believe they'll have another in the shape of Mark Reckless with another by-election coming up in Rochester and Strew. A lot of them are good people, they're my friends, they share our values, they're let down by a leadership that's in politics for itself, they're let down by a party that thinks it's okay to smear good people like Mark Reckless. I think uh, many of them I hope will... will We'll reflect on that, but what's really important is not whether or not MPs make the journey, there are tens of thousands of voters who I think are up for making the journey. There is some degree of truth in the argument that UKIP's appeal is partly about punishing the mainstream political parties. A recent Guardian ICM poll noted an unprecedented shift as both the government and opposition lost votes to UKIP. 
again indicating a general sense of disillusionment with the current political system. I think a lot of the press focusing on one or two issues, immigration being the big hot one. But a general disenchantment with um, sort of career politicians telling us what to do, uh, and that, that's irrespective of whether they're Labour or Conservative. The Lib Dems obviously you know, have their own issues at the moment as well. I'm not being racist, but they come over here mate, and get everything they need. Whereas these British people, they just struggle like mad. Wrapping themselves in the flag and excoriating what they view as a corrupt elite, these protest parties attract the support of alienated voters from across the political spectrum. By channeling economic distress and cultural alienation into resentment of foreigners, welfare beneficiaries and government officials, they come to drive the political agenda. In reflecting on UKIP's future, one can say with some degree of certainty that the issues that generate support for populist parties of the centre-right will continue for some time to come, at least among more insecure members of the ethnic majority. Yet this will not be enough to ensure UKIP's success longer term. First, the current electoral system works against smaller parties, so that it is extremely difficult for them to get MPs elected to Westminster. Second, voters are far cannier than some political pundits assume. Voters understand the significance of the electoral cycle and the difference between local, European and general elections. By the way, it's not always honey and butter for UKIP. UKIP's group in the European Parliament collapsed after the departure of Latvian MEP Iveta Grigule, which left it bereft of the minimum seven countries needed to qualify as an official parliamentary grouping. This will not just mean a loss of status, it will result in a major blow to the party's influence, with the loss of millions of euros worth of official funding for support staff and communications, and significantly less legislative influence, although given UKIP's lack of attendance, the latter point is rather a moot one. Given the fact that UKIP's very raison d'etre is antipathy towards European cooperation, it's perhaps not altogether surprising that its group in the European Parliament has fallen apart. But we should remember that not long ago, pundits were predicting that Eurosceptic and far-right parties would dominate the new Parliament. Many feared that a new alliance of populist and anti-European MEPs could lead to legislative gridlock and block progress on vital EU reforms. As it happens, the MEP group Nigel Farage cobbled together is the shortest lived in history. Scepticism is one of its main messages and carried within that is of course a complaint about the level of immigration uh, which is still running relatively high into the United Kingdom and driving up population in part. But I think there's more to it than that. I mean, if you look at the, vote, the, the profile of UKIP's uh, voters, they tend to be older, they tend to be poorer, and they tend to have had fewer educational opportunities. If you add all of that together, then their, you know, their appeal is to people who feel that the elite political class just isn't interested in them. Mr Farage just looks different, he dresses differently, he's willing to be seen, you know, drinking and smoking in public or, you know, being seen to have a drink in public, which is pretty unusual for politicians. So, uh, you know, of course he's not as different as all that from our major political parties' leaderships, but he's different enough to convince a significant minority of the population that he is different. The British electorate over many decades has shown pretty great distaste for extremist parties. It did in the 1930s. And although occasionally you get a sort of flowering of an extremist right-wing party, a sort of nationalist party, they tend to come and go and collapse under their own uh, contradictions and failures. UKIP isn't like that. UKIP is a much more problematic issue for the older parties because it is within the mainstream. And it, you know, it's, it's not like the Front National, for example, in France. It has different roots to that. And particularly now, it's seen as a respectable way to register a protest. Could the old-timer Conservatives be in for a purple UKIP-style politics? Give us your take on all this. 
because it's important to us. Our Facebook page is named UK Desk Press TV and our email is britain at presstv.ir. We'll be back next week, God willing. So keep on watching the monarchy because the monarchy will keep on watching the UK. Be well and goodbye from me and the team.